and now I'm going to introduce um, our speaker and uh, we were going through the sort of formal, formal introduction oh he's been working for this company that company and then we kind of finished with a very simple but very efficient I think introduction he's been working in the business analysis since what 1995 you can imagine that in project management which you all familiar with um, since 1996 and with agile uh, you know approaches within the agile community with agile practices since 2003 i think what it tells me it's a lot of experience lots of practical stuff and i'd like you to welcome chris Matz and uh, we're looking forward to his talk thank you thank you Sergei. and thank you um, as project managers working with agile these days do, do any of you ever feel like this yeah there's just so much of this stuff to do. Um, I think there's a reason for that. If you want to know how to write code, uh, there's a stack of books that much higher than this building that tells you how to write code in an agile way. There's a stack of books probably about yay high telling you how the team should run. There's a stack of books that high telling you how to motivate your team and stuff. The stack of books that tells you how to uh, do other stuff is a bit smaller. And in fact, if you go and ask these experts out there in Agile how you should organize your organization, they'll draw an org chart like this. Yeah? Has anyone kind of encountered that kind of attitude? We need the CEO, they make the decisions, and then at the bottom we've got all these teams, and these teams kick ass. And after about 10 years of doing this, the teams are really good at delivering. Yeah? It's just that when you put them together, they're not so great. And, and, and let's be honest, you know those experts in Agile that come in and do the training and tell the teams how to do it, and that the managers should just get out of the way? That they're, they're really thinking of a, an org chart that looks like this. Yeah? And the reality is that if you actually look at the, the Agile community, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people with experience of writing software, of managing small teams, yeah? and coaching small teams. They've got decades of experience, there's thousands of people. But there are actually very, very few people working in that bit in the middle who've got real good knowledge about Agile, and it, the Agile community hasn't made it that easy for them people to get started, other than to say, you know what, you're better off working somewhere else because we don't need you lot. Yeah? What I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to give you uh, a little bit of an experience report and perhaps give you some ideas about what we should be doing in that middle part and what you guys could perhaps be doing. Um, but before I do, I want to do a little thing. Yeah? What I want you to do is pair up in twos. So get twos. If there's three of you, if there's an odd three on the table, into the three. And I'm going to give you three minutes and I want you to come up with an answer. What do the people in the middle do? Yeah? Not the people at the team level, but what are the people who are not the CEO, you're not in the teams. What is it that those people should be doing? So in pairs or in groups of three, I'd like you to answer that question. What should those people be doing? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, uh, Miriam and Sergey are just going to wander around the room. Has anyone got anything they'd like to share? Uh, so the th thing we pulled out first was collaboration, ensuring collaboration between sort of functional teams to create a delivery team. So ensuring that developers are connected with testers primarily, but then te connected to technical writers, compliance teams, um, IS teams, so that teams are working in sort of a synergy to create to form that delivery team. So understanding that collaboration just doesn't necessarily happen spontaneous with people you don't know that they're to be doing stuff, yeah. but someone needs to manage that. Yeah, I like that. Anyone else got any thoughts on what should the people in the middle be doing? I think uh, main job is the communication. You know, communicating upwards and downwards. That's that's the, that's one of the main thing that uh, the guy in the middle has to do. 
you know, the communicating the uh, the message from the top to the bottom, and then the what is happening in the bottom to the to the top level, and also allow top level to see what can be done at the you know the bottom level, or what it can be done at the team level, or how that can be changed, or how that can be you know uh, worked in more efficiently or in better way. And so making sure effective communication yeah. is happening. Yeah. 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 Good. So um, William and I were saying that um, we felt that the CEO needs to drive the vision for change across the rest of the organisation. So the whole of the, you know, that, that big bit that's missing in there, which is the rest of the company, product, finance, QA, wh whoever, yeah, we need a mindset and a cultural change across there. So they need to change so that our agile teams can work effectively in a more agile way. It's not just the teams. Yep. Anyone else? Uh, yes, and we were um, going a bit more specific on that. We were talking about um, the the, uh, the people who are if it's if it's a business which sells development or the, the product that these teams are making, then the business development person really needs to understand you know how agile works in order to be able to sell or even create new types of business opportunities. I don't know if it's included in the teams layer, but the sort of softer side of things, so ensuring that teams have got the, the tools and the training necessary to deliver a roadmap of projects or whatever, so just you know, ensuring that everyone's happy and can deliver against the commitment. Okay, cool. Yeah. Any Apart from motivating the teams, uh, the middle layer is also responsible for making decisions that the team cannot uh, take on their own. Yep. Okay. It, it may be that I'm kind of I'm kind of going to interpret that one, but I think sometimes about making decisions, it's a case of making the decisions made appropriately. Yeah. So not necessarily that the people in the middle make the decisions, but they make sure that the appropriate knowledge is brought in to make those decisions. Yeah. Any, should we have one more? Anyone got one that is burning to kind of share? Just, it's kind of similar. Uh, it's a facilitator to make things happen. And yeah. so certain things you get stuck or you don't know what to do. So to escalate or make, move things along and act as a facilitator. Also, I have to say, in big banks, there's still a lot of governance, whatever you do. And there's someone who needs to take care of that governance structure, which is there, because it doesn't go off even if you're somewhat agile. Someone to take care of that too. Cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm going to present a slightly different view of Agile to you guys, to the way you probably think of it at the moment. A lot of people see Agile as this thing that's just a pain in the ass. Agile is probably one of the greatest opportunities for the people in this room that's been presented in your working lifetimes. Yeah? Because you know what? No one has all the answers yet. Now, this is the wild west of Agile. Now, believe me, Agile is not going to go away. It's just going to roll out. You can kind of close your eyes and ignore it, but you're going to go bankrupt because the other company who works out how to do this is going to beat you. Yeah? The ability to respond to the market and stuff like this. There's a huge opportunity out there, and it's really an opportunity for you guys to start seeing what are some of the other companies doing? What are some of the, the problems that have been solved? Yeah? Or perhaps people have had a good crack at it and almost solved it. Because in the same way that perhaps 15 years ago people didn't know how to write software, but now there's this kind of huge stack of books telling them how to do it. At the moment, the bit in the middle, the, is the kind of stuff out there is like that thin, and a lot of it is wrong. So there's an opportunity for people like you in the room to go out there and actually help them write the right books. Yeah? To actually lead this charge. And as a result, you will be rewarded for that. Yeah? So I'm going to share a story um, of uh, an organization I work with. Thousands of developers, yeah? hundreds of scrum teams, um, hundreds of product managers, yeah? nine geographical time zones. Yeah? Recognize this pattern, anyone? Yeah? Anyone kind of experience that kind of organization? M yeah, masses of interdependence. Yeah, lots of teams coordinating with other teams and really struggling to deliver. Yeah, you may have some teams who are doing Scrum or Kanban and at the team level they're rocking, but fundamentally you're struggling to get stuff out the door because you've got lots of bits that are kind of partly there but you haven't got the whole thing. 
So the first thing we had to solve was creating that backlog for the organization. Yeah, and so what we did is we, we created a process, and I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Um, if you're interested on my blog at the end, there's kind of a more detailed exper experience report that will tell you how we did it. But we basically started off with what I call a backlog of unicorn horns. This was all the wish list of all, everyone in the organization. And what happens with those normally is that the managers would go up to a team and go, I, I want this. And if a senior manager goes up to a team, they go, yes, sir, we'll do it. Or yes, ma'am, we'll do it. And so what was the number one priority in the backlog was normally the item that had been asked by the last senior manager that went to speak to them. And they'd be going round in a group, and by the time they'd moved on to the next team and got that to number one in the backlog, someone else had actually gone over here and said, we want this, and they go, okay, we'll put it at the top. We needed an organizational backlog, and so what we did, we did it based on capacity. We did very broad brush, so you'd have an idea, we want to do this new business, and as a result, it's going to affect 10 teams. We'd go to each of those 10 teams and go, give us an estimate in kind of team weeks. How long, how long would it take a team to do roughly in weeks? Yeah? And we'd get all of these items, and then we'd get all of the business stakeholders to sit together, and then prioritize that list. But they didn't need to prioritize everything. They only needed to prioritize them where the, the ask in terms of the unicorn horns was greater than any individual team's capacity to deliver it. And at the end of that process, they'd come out with an organizational backlog for the next quarter. So they'd have a list of the items in order so that teams would know this is the order we're going to work on things. Yeah. What we also get as a side effect here was a capacity view of the organization. So we'd be able to see which teams have got more than 100% capacity you know, the sliding scale and then which teams had got no requests on that backlog. Because normally what happens is you've got a team, they request something there and they assume they're going to do a load of work. The problem is they just need a week's work from the other team. Yeah? This, this, this one team, if they had a week's work, they could deliver everything. The only problem is that other team is working on a whole load of other stuff that's of higher priority. Yeah? So you can see this view of where your capacity is available in the organization. You can see who's working on the strategic stuff and is overworked, and who has got spare capacity. And ideally what we want to do is move the spare capacity up to the people here. And that's the point where you're going to run into your HR policies and your, um, uh, what is it, your, what do, oh, my brain's just gone blank. It's, it's the performance appraisal process. Because what you'll discover is that the people at the bottom are dissing. If you've got any kind of stack ranking, if you do anything that compares one set of developers uh, to another set, whether it's a team or individually, if you're working down here and you've got nothing strategic to work on, the last thing you want to do is go and work on an unfamiliar system where you're going to be obviously inferior to the people who are doing it. Yeah? The most valuable thing they could do is go and work alongside, even though they're perhaps only at 20% capacity, because we can ship one extra feature at the organizational level. Who do you think needs to manage this process? Is the CEO going to do this? Because it's a lot of work. There's a lot of information to be gathered here. Not only that, when we've got that capacity view, someone needs to manage the risk and make sure that we're actually building capacity in the right place. Can anyone imagine who would be doing that? Are the teams going to do it? Is the CEO going to do it? Yeah. Someone's got to do it. So we know about our backlog. And what we do is we hand that backlog down to the teams. The teams build all this stuff, and as a result, we get our outcome. Yeah? Happier customers, more customers signing up, you know, better engagement with the customer, whatever it is. And from that outcome, we can go and we can use that to feed back into what are our priorities, what are the things we're going to do. Who's going to make sure that this process is going to work? Yeah? Are the teams going to do this? Is the CEO going to do this? There's an interesting thing about this. Um, we were doing this, we were just kind of telling the teams this is what we want. And the teams were delivering. They were delivering 60% of the work they were being asked for. But these unicorn horns that we were putting into the process only a few percent of those were being delivered because 
No one was managing the coordination. No one was managing the collaboration and the communication. And so all we did is we didn't give them control. We didn't give them authority. We gave them responsibility. And we said, you are now responsible for that piece of work to be delivered. And we saw the number of MVPs go up from 2% to 30%. Just by assigning responsibility, nothing else. Yeah? Just by having a product owner responsible for the whole thing, making sure the decisions were made at that level. And a project manager who was coordinating and making sure people were collaborating in the right way. Once again, who's going to do that? Are the teams doing that? Is the CEO doing that? Who else is doing that? And this is what I mean. Is like If you look at the team, uh, how many of you have come across this burn down? Yeah? Familiar with this? What the idea is that the team goes, right, we've committed to take on 30 points during this period of time. The dotted line represents the ideal, and the, and the set line shows how we're actually delivering against that dotted line. And we can see what's going on. Now, if you remember what I was saying about the unicorn horns, we just get very high-level estimates of what's required because we don't want to burden the organization with you know, endless hours of estimation and prediction on stuff that we're not even going to build. And so you know, we're saying to them, right, how long do you think this will do? And they say, two weeks. So when they do and make that estimate, it's very high level. We haven't got the detail. We haven't even written the stories. So we've got no way to do a burn down. So your view as a manager is going to be more one where you go, let me look at how, how many stories we're creating during the period across the teams or within a team across the MVPs. And let's see how many have been completed so that we can start to get visibility in this process across the organization. And once again, who's going to do this? I asked the Scrum Master, one of the guys working in the team, because that's you know, theoretically meant to be what they do. I said, we asked the team, the, the, all the Scrum Masters, are you going to do this? And they were like, no. We manage the team. We really don't have the grade, the experience, the authority to manage across the teams. So the team, the Scrum Masters don't want to do this. So who's going to do it? Is the CEO going to do it? Yeah. And don't forget that this kind of reporting at the moment, you cannot buy a book that with common sense, a common sense book that you open and say, this is how you manage IT projects in an agile organization. Yeah? So the question is, will it be one of the people in this room that writes that book? Or contributes to it, perhaps? And of course, what we need is governance. Yeah? This is a system, like a steam engine. Do you remember the steam engines? They'd have a governor. Do you know what a governor is? It's the, it's the thing. And if the steam pressure gets too high, the steam engines used to blow up. So they'd have this thing that if the, team's pre the speed would be based on the pressure, and if the pressure went up, it'd speed faster and faster, and centripetal forces would lift the lever and then let the pressure off. That's what a governor is. It's about risk management. It's about making sure that the risks in the system are managed properly, whatever they are. So who's going to do that? And there's two parts to this. There's risk management and there's coaching. So take the catcher in the rye as the, initial, as the, uh, the metaphor. You're the catcher in the rye. You're watching a bunch of kids playing in a cornfield, and they're close to a cliff. What your job is, is to identify the risk and tell them to manage it. Yeah? Your job is not to tell them how to manage it. You call the kids over and go, stop playing kids, come over here. Have you seen this cliff? They are, oh, no, we didn't notice the cliff. Yeah, well, I want you to manage that risk. And they go, well, no, well, yeah, well, we don't, yeah, well, you know what, we're, we're, we'll do it. We're, no, no, no. Just ignoring it is not an acceptable way to handle this risk. What you have to do is manage it properly because you know what? When you guys get excited and are playing a game and you're chasing after each other, one of them, one of you is going to run over, run off and fall off the cliff. Yeah. So I want you to manage that risk, and they go. But we don't know how. You're now a coach because they've asked you for your help, and so you say, "Well, you build a wall." And they go, "We don't know how." And as a coach, you go. Let me introduce you to someone who can help you build a wall. Now, that might be you, or it might be someone else. But all you care about 
is they manage the risk. Now, if they turn around and say, you know what, we've got this really crazy, wonderful way of managing the risk, you can choose, does the way that they're actually managing the risk make sense or not? Yeah? So you're allowing them the space to innovate around the process, but the thing is, you're controlling the risk and you're controlling the decision because you are the representatives of the organization. Yeah? And there's a whole load of risks in the organization that are not properly managed at the moment. Yeah? Most risk reports on IT projects are laughable. Let's get real risk management in place. Okay. So we're going to do an exercise now. So I've told you now you're all going to be risk managers. And that's kind of scary because it's like, how do I be a risk manager? Yeah? And it's, a, it's just a simple change of the way you perceive what your role is. In the past, we've built up a lot of process. You know, you look at Prince 2 and it's this massive document telling you all these things you need to do. Everything in there was put in place because on a project there was a problem or a risk or a something that needed to be solved. And so they introduced this thing. Yeah? So every process step that we've got pretty much is about risk. Yeah? It's about managing a risk. But what we've done is we've stopped talking about risk. We've started talking about process. And now we're imposing lots and lots of process. And as a result, sometimes we're not managing the risks. We're actually just managing process. And so we need to get away from managing process to managing risk. And we let the teams decide what the process is. And we just sit there in judgment and decide, have you managed that risk appropriately? Oh, and by the way, you guys who are doing that, you're putting a lot of effort in over here. Why don't you go and have a look at what the guys are doing over here? Because they find it so much easier to manage that risk, and you can learn from them. Yeah? And you've got a bigger perspective and a bigger view. So, we're going to do an exercise now. Yeah. Um, you can choose whether you break into twos or threes, or if you want to do this as a table. But what I want you to do now is an exercise. I want each one of you to come up with a process point. Yeah? Something that you have in your process that you think is important. That's the first step. Once you've done that, as a group, I want you to go around and discuss those process points and say, what risk are we trying to manage with this process point? Yeah. Got that? Everyone clear? Once you've done that, as a group, I want you to brainstorm about what are all the different ways that you could manage that risk. And in particular, what I'd like you to do is think, imagine we're in an agile organization. How would we manage that risk in an agile organization? Yeah? That's the exercise. So I'm going to give you 10 minutes to do the exercise. And then we're going to have five minutes where people share what they've learned. That's an intimate OK. So, it's, actually, it's kind of one of those things that it, it sounds easy when I stick up the slides, but it actually takes a lot of thought to get into. What you'll find is that it's one of those things that the first time you do it, it will take you a little while to get your head around it, but then after a while it gets faster and faster. So one of the, one of the groups asked me a question and it reminded me why I put it in here and I kind of forgot to say. Uh, a few years ago, um, I was working on a system where it was very important. It was, for whatever historic reasons, it was of great interest to the organization I was in. And as a result, I had a full methodology audit. So I had a three-hour conversation going through the organization's standard methodology, the standard process steps. And at each step, we basically failed the whole audit because we weren't doing anything they wanted us to do. And I said, right, look, OK, we failed everything, but..." What I want to do is I'm going to go back, I'm going to go through every process point that you've asked for, every sign off, every tick and whatever, and I'm going to get you to identify the risk that we're doing. So with this very kind of patient methodology auditor, I went through over a three hour period every point and I said, right, what risk are we mitigating? Um, and I'm going to pick up on your group because yours was a great example. And for each risk, I then explained how we mitigated that risk. Yeah. And at the end of the three hours, the auditor said, you know what, we're going to adopt Agile. 
because we were looking at it from a risk perspective and we were making sure we were managing the risks rather than just following the process. So this group came up with a great example, which was final sign-off. We're about to go live with this product. How do we make sure we've got the right, you know, the final sign-off? So the first kind of thing is, well, we shouldn't be going into a meeting in management or whatever telling us, okay, this is what you need to do to get the sign-off. Yeah? Because really the question is that when we go in and we get final sign-off is, hey, look, we've just sat in a cupboard for the last two years developing this stuff. We want to put it live, and if it goes live, it could destroy the company. And so we would like you to put a, piece of, a signature on a piece of paper so that if it does destroy the company, you, senior manager, lose your job and not as the workers. Because that's what the final sign-off is for, isn't it? It's risk transference, it's not risk reduction. And the way that we generally, in Agile, we'd say, well, that's not appropriate. Because what happens is, I don't know if you notice this, whenever you do the final sign-off meeting, the managers always manage to think of something else you need to do. Because they're just trying to eke out their career a little bit longer before they get sacked. So have you, have you, have you done it in blue? No, we haven't thought of it. Oh, right, okay. You know, in fact, in Agile, we'd say that those, any acceptance criteria should be specified at the very start, which means at the very start you need to identify your, all of your stakeholders and get their acceptance criteria so that you know that you can release. And really, it's kind of a formality, and they should all be informed all the while going through so that if they think of something, they can add it. But as they add it, there should be a kind of a stern look at them and going, really, that acceptance criteria? That should have happened over here. Yeah? You're not a saviour of the project, so here's where your culture is going to have to change. You're not a saviour because you came up with something just before we went live to prevent us getting bankrupt. No, you're actually an enemy of the project and the company because you should have come up with it earlier. Cultural change. Let's be clear, the reason we have a final sign-off is because we want to transfer the risk from us to our managers so that they're sacked instead of us. Right? What we really want to do, the reason that's there, is because we want to mitigate the chance that we damage the organisation by putting the release out. Yeah? So the way we mitigate that risk is not by getting our manager who knows less about the situation than we do to sign off so that he gets sacked instead of us. No, the way we mitigate that situation is to release it in such a way that if there is a problem, we can roll it back before we damage the organisation. That we've thought about how we detect problems and roll back the problem so that very quickly we go, oh, yeah, toe in the water, too hot, out we come, we'll have another go. Yeah? Does that make sense? So I want you to start thinking about risk rather than process. Yeah, because when you're looking at risk, you're much more valuable to the organisation than when you're just making sure people are following the process. Yeah? The other thing about risk is it's very difficult to kind of like manage and look for risk when you're running around as fast as you can, which the teams are doing. What you ideally want is someone who sat there relaxed, drinking a cup of coffee, going, I'm managing risks. I'm looking for risk. Yeah? The risk that two of the members of your team went out two weeks ago, fell out in the pub and haven't been talking to each other since, and as a result, something bad happens. You can't spot that when you're in meetings all day, when you're running around. No, a really good risk manager is someone who just sits at their desk drinking coffee and doing nothing. Because that's the only way you're going to spot stuff. Yeah. And that isn't real reason I justify the fact that I spend all day in the coffee shop. Also means you need to get to know your people because you know what, your people are a big risk. You've got these great talent, you've got world class talent. And don't you think your competitors know that? Yeah. How are you going to mitigate the risk of your people leaving if you don't know that they want to leave because they're unhappy? Yeah. Once again, let's go out and have a coffee with them. Don't manage the process, manage the risk. That's kind of the end of it for me. I just really want to ask, is, is anyone thinking now, you know what, I want to actually start thinking about risk a bit more. Is anyone going to take this away and start thinking? Go through your process. Go through the methodology audits or whatever. And ask yourself, what risk? Anyone who's... Could I just ask a show of hands? Who, who, who's interested in going away and doing that? Finding out about, more about risk. Yeah? Because, you know what? In the future, my prediction is that you guys won't be called project managers. 
you will be called IT risk managers. And you'll probably be paid twice what you're being paid now. Because you'll be incredibly valuable to the organization. An organization at the moment that's going agile that kind of sits there and resents you and goes, we don't need you to tell us how to build a wall. We're so much more effective at building walls than you are. OK, that's it. Um, if, uh, this is my Twitter thing. It's Papa Chris Matz, mainly because Father Chris Matz is too long for Twitter. It wouldn't let me put Father Chris Matz. Uh, that's my blog, theitriskmanager.wordpress.com, um, where all the, a lot of the stuff we've done today, it's all written up there. Any questions? Has anyone got any questions? You don't have to have questions, but you, you are allowed them. Thank you. Um, I was very interested in the slide when you, were, when you put the backlog together and you said that you prioritize the different items or you call them the unicorn horns um, based on the capacity required and if it was beyond the capacity of the team. Mm -hmm. um, was that the only uh, prioritization criteria? Was there any strategic alignment taken into account or should it be taken into account? Because I think there's so many other criteria we can took into account and that uh, backlog order will just change. So what, what we did was we basically constrained the decision process. Yeah? So we did not tell the senior management how they had to prioritize. And what happened is that the senior management prioritized according to whatever mechanism, whether it's based on the strategy or whatever. And the CEO is involved in this as well. Yeah? The, um, the, the interesting thing that happens is because you're now looking at the constraints in the system and you've got one team that can only deliver six weeks worth of work, but the rest of the organization requires 50 weeks of work from them, there's probably only going to be two things you, that require that team that can actually be built. And so it, what it does is rather than having this situation where whoever asked for that team last gets their item prioritized but it never gets finished, it forces the senior management together to actually decide what is the priority. And as part of that, they will bring in the strategic initiatives and the strategic views. But it's a constraint that the organization places on them that they can't just have 50 things. They can only have two because that's all the capacity they've got. And it, the, the, the problem we have at the moment is that there's this belief that, okay, we've got... Uh, you know, we, we're going to throw. You know, we, we're going to increase the budget by 10%. We've got another 100 million. That's great. We can obviously increase our capacity by 10%. You can't because some of those teams, it might take it six months for someone to come up to speed to fully understand the component or the system they're working on. You know, maybe really specialised skills, and it <coughs> acknowledges that, and it makes senior management acknowledge that these teams are not just infinitely flexible, and brings it to reality. But in terms of the process that they use, that's down to that, that, that management group, whether they just do hippos, so whoever's the, kind of the, the highest paid person's opinion wins, or whether they use cost of delay, or they build business cases, or whatever it is. But what we have seen is that just by making that constraint, what will happen is that to begin with, the hippos will probably get their own way. But then after a couple of quarters, the kind of less senior directors will start getting upset about the fact that they're getting none of the constrained resources, and they'll start pushing. And so that you'll see that a more rational kind of process emerges because you know, they're not happy with the fact that it's unfair. Mm -hmm. Without that, what happens, as I say, is that you actually deliver nothing because... Uh, you know, you've got these developer, you've got the product owner on a team of six developers. You know, they can only deliver two things, and then ev every two hours a different senior director comes in. You know, a, a level 27 comes in and talks to the level two and says, right, I want my stuff at the top of the backlog. And he goes, great, I'll move it. Great, thanks. And then he goes out and another one comes in and he does the same. Yeah. Okay. So just a question around the... Um the uh, logistics, if you like, of managing risks and whether, you know, the traditional risk register is still, I mean, 
it's still relevant and required. I, mean, I, haven't, I've, I haven't actually got one, but I feel like I'm managing risks. But is there a best practice for how you keep all these things uh, up to date and at the so, forefront of your mind? So the, the, the thing about traditional risk registers, I really hate them. Uh, absolutely detest them. So what you normally find is that there's a risk, and then next to it there's a severity of the impact, which is kind of high, medium, and low. And then next to it is probability of the impact, high, medium, and low. And if you've got something that's high severity but you can't manage, you just mark it as low probability, because then you can ignore it. Uh, that probability column needs to just disappear off your spreadsheet. The only thing you care about is the risk and the impact. And what's interesting is what happens is when you identify the risk, what you want to do is for every risk, you want to think it through and think, right, what's our mitigation strategy? How quickly can we respond? And so the question you ask yourself is, let's assume this risk materializes. Um, how quickly can we respond? And how long can the business survive if it does occur? And if you can respond quicker uh, in a shorter period of time than the business can respond, well, you're OK. If your business goes bankrupt or you have a serious problem before you can fix it, then you need more options. And one of the interesting things here, this is about time. It's about response time. So imagine, hypothetically, uh, you have a games console, and the DBA notices that someone has hacked into the database containing the credit cards of all your customers. Yeah? What happens is the DBA goes, well, I, I think I should shut down the database, but you know, uh, I'd get sacked if I did that, so I'm going to ask my boss. So he asks your boss. So he asks his boss, and his boss goes, yeah, you know, I think you're right. I'm only a work level two, and if I turn off the database and no one can actually use the system, I'm going to get sacked. He says, well, I'll have a word with my boss, but he's on holiday, so he's not going to be very happy if I wait. And so you then get to the point where he goes, the boss comes back off holiday, and he goes, what should I do? He goes, oh, Jesus, you should do that. Um, I'm going to speak to my boss, though. And three weeks later the CEO of your company just goes, shit, turn it off. And it's all the delays that got you. So every risk, and you kind of need to get a bit imaginative these days because some of the risks are kind of not so obvious. You need to make sure you know what you're doing so that, the, so that the DBA, as soon as he detects that intrusion on the database, just goes, turn off. Doesn't even need to go and ask his boss. He just, he knows what to do. Yeah? So the key thing is the time and we need to lose that probability thinking. And the reason, one of the reasons is, um, if you look at the heuristics around people who make uh, predictions about bad events, humans are notorious for understating the probability of a bad event. Yeah. Black swans, as we like to call them. Does that answer your? Cool. Yeah. Um, so going back to the capacity and capacity planning, um, yeah. have you had a situation whereby You've done capacity planning. You found out that you have more work than you have uh, for the resources to, to manage it. You've gone to senior management to prioritise the work, and you've got six things that you said are priorities, but they're all number ones. That's not a prioritised list. Yeah. The, 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 yeah, the outcome of this process is a backlog. It's an ordered list. They can say, well, the top ten are a, a priority number one. We go, that's great, but yeah, but what's the order of those top ten? So there are two outcomes. One of them is priority and the other is the capacity. As a little, little nugget, if you actually do this, when you actually give them the capacity, you only give them 50% of the available capacity. So if you've got a team, it's a 12-week period, and you've got one team, you only give them capacity of six because you need the other just because that's what the industry statistics tell us. Yeah? Because what's going to happen is there's going to be urgent bug fixes and stuff like that they need to attend to, all the delays and the queues will actually eat up the other 50%. Well, we've done something similar. We said 50% is BAU, but yeah, we were told we had six priority number ones, and we have to plan according to that, which... Um, well, they've not told yeah, you the priority. Exactly. So here, here's the thing. Um, uh, if, if the business do... If the, all of the executives do not come together and tell you, right, those six number ones, here's the priority, right, what they're saying is... We personally do not feel competent enough to make strategic organizational decisions 
about which is the order that we should do this stuff. And so what we would like to do as work level 27s is we'd like the work level 2, who's the product owner for that group, to make the decisions for us. Yeah? They're actually delegating responsibility all the way down to people who have no context and what they will do is they'll prioritise based on which of those six people come to visit them last. Which means they won't deliver anything. So. Hi there, sorry, I just wanted to go back to the risk log um, question. I just wanted to understand what you could possibly use instead of a risk log. Um, a risk log, a proper risk log. And, but the key, the, the key elements that you're looking for in your risk log is where is in a traditional one you go, here's my risk, here's my severity, here's the probability, medium, high, low. Get rid of the probability. It's just dangerous. High severity, anything that's high severity in that needs a mitigation strategy. Yeah? And the key decisions you need to understand in your new risk log is how long will it take us to resolve that risk and how long can we survive with it. And what you'll find is that as you go through this process, you'll discover that, you're, that it, it's actually time that gets, causes a lot of this risk. So it's the time it takes from that DBA up to the CEO. And by doing some of these, you can short circuit them so that just by going through the process, you'll actually help some of those situations. But it's understanding that, you know, the, that the final sign-off is not a risk mitigation strategy. It just removes, the, it, just, it just changes who gets sacked when it goes wrong. And let's be honest, they're mean people. They, they'll make sure you get sacked as well. Um, whereas having a resilient system where you can roll back quickly or that you only release to a fraction of the users and then gradually roll out will actually mitigate the risk properly. Okay, so yeah, so the risk log is dead. Long live the risk log. And that's the thing about a lot of this stuff is you're going to be doing a lot of the stuff you're doing now, but instead of just following the process, you're going to be understanding why you're doing it. What, what, what's really interesting when you come to this risk thing is, we, we, you know, the definition, who's heard of the definition of done out of curiosity? In Scrum, they have this definition of done. You know, you, you got the backlog, you do the work, and then it's done. And then they have a definition of done, because what happens is you say to the developers, Bring me a car, and they bring you a car, but then there's no petrol in it. And you go, that's not done, there's no petrol. And they go, you didn't, so you wanted petrol. Well, it's obvious if you deliver a car, there's petrol in it. So that's the definition of done. We did a process where we took all of those items in the definition of done and converted them into risks. What's the risk we're mitigating? And then the managers said to the teams, here's the risk you need to manage. And the teams were actually really cool with that. They weren't micromanaging, they were happy. So... Um, by moving to risk instead of process, you'll find less resistance as well with the teams. Anyway, I, 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 how are we doing for time? We've uh... we got one last question. Okay. I think just to add on to uh, on the risk itself, I think the more often uh, when we do the risk logging or when we maintain the risk register, we actually identify wrong risk. Now, risk is not, the hacking is not a risk. If the database is get, uh, gets hacked, that's not the risk. Risk is that customer will get affected. And the more often we actually identify the wrong risk, when we you know work on the risk register, you know, I I see you know more often that we we log the wrong risk actually. The risk is that putting of the customer, which we fail to identify or putting it in clear words. The risk is putting of the customer actually, not the not the hacking itself. Yes, I mean there there are three categories of risk in in the work we do. The first one is delivery risk, and that's the one that most of the methodologies focus on. Yeah, risk that we fail to deliver on time, on budget, to scope. There are two other categories which are much more important. The first one is business case risk. Are we doing the right thing? Are we investing in the right thing? And almost nothing in IT actually kind of mitigates that. And the third one, as you say, is it's um, damage to the existing business model. And that's really about making sure we the risk to our customers to make sure they don't migrate. And be a risk manager and understand that the two categories of risk that are most important to your organization are ones that generally no one ever thinks about. Yeah. Or if they do, they don't talk about them. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming. I think there's some fun stuff now. So uh, yeah, Definitely. Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Chris. Round of applause, please, for Chris.